let's talk about secret romances for a little bit. Now, you also have a challenge because you're dealing with a very haughty, totty mm-hmm. uh, woman that is stuck up to the wealth in her nose, right? That's a good description. <laughs> like the devil's wear Prada. You know, right. The clean. Right. Yes. And then you have this cute, sassy cheerleader, and then you have a father, and then you have a son. And yeah. how do you prepare going in and out of all of these? Um, well, I the same kind of thing as Rebecca was saying is I just kind of, I am that character. So I, I feel that when I before I read, I highlight in different colors each person's um you know, when they're, they're, when they're speaking. And so I know that it's coming up. And so I get, I feel that person and I be that person when I'm reading it. So yeah, I go. Too, no, you know? I pretty much read cold, which okay. I read through. All right. I, but. I was curious. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I, I read it through to make sure you know, I know who's what, because a lot of times, especially with no tags, sometimes it's like, wait a minute, who was saying that? I got to make sure, you know, and right. so I just, I, I get that all straight. So really it's just, I just am each of those people. Mm-hmm. So when I see that color for that person, I know, oh, here come, and then I'm the, the you know, the big man the or the, you know, eh, whatever, you know, and, and, and again, it's, it, yeah, no. it's the facial expressions. It's the whole thing. You just, you are, you're acting really, but they just hear your voice. <laughs> I have to say that the color thing is a really good idea because it allows you to have a little bit of time to, to yes. it's coming. Yes. Of, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. I, I found that that helped me tremendously when I did my first book that had like 30 different characters. I was like, how am I going to keep these straight? And so I, I color coded everybody. And well, imagine Scott Ellis with the keystroke killer with like a hundred characters. Yeah. Yeah. Every, I mean, women, men, gays, transgenders, you name it it's in there and God love him. Woo. nice yeah it was the, yeah that was that was an audition uh i'll explain some of my audition process in a minute but tim i want to go to you for a second mm-hmm. um how do you prepare and you don't do as much fiction as the, uh, the the ladies right here but what what is your mindset when you're doing these things well for nonfiction, you know a lot of people you know okay yeah it's dry and dull not exactly because, you know, I am trying to, when I'm narrating a nonfiction book, I'm, you know, the person who wrote this book put a lot into that. They're passionate about what they did. And I'm trying to reflect that passion. You know, one of my repeat customers, a gentleman from England, writes a lot of stuff about computers. You want to talk about dry and dull. (laughs) But he's, you know, it's his life. He really loves what he's doing. So I'm trying to get that emotion across. Um, And so, and and I'm kind of like Rebecca. I don't pre-read the entire thing. I'll usually do it in sections, a, you know, a section or a chapter at a time, just so I kind of know what's coming. But, you know, bringing that emotion across, even in nonfiction, I think is important for narrators. You're not just reading this stuff. You're trying to get a message across. And it's more than just reading. Um, And for the few fiction things that I've done, um, it's the same kind of thing. And, you know, the, the whole thing with not having the attribution tags for the characters that you do, Dr. Mel, you know, at when I first started reading some of your work, that drove me out of my mind, you know, because I was, you know, because I was so used to having those tags to depend on. Right. Uh, for those that know, I did audition for <laughs> Keystro Killer. I did not yes, get did. the job, but the auditions in and of themselves were quite educational, um, especially some of those scenes that you gave me. To, <laughs> to well, aud- I had to make sure you could handle the content. You know, right. The, the, the Keystroke Killer, we'll go back to that is a very dark, deep, twisted, psychological thriller about several serial killers, not just one. Wow. And the premise of that is it almost becomes like a serial killer club. And so you have to be in the moment uh, with some of these killers. 
And to prepare for that book, and I'll tell you a little bit about all of my books here in a second, but to prepare for that book, I interviewed serial killers on wow. death row. I went wow. and spoke with them and talked with them to get into their heads. And it wasn't that I wanted to hear the blood and the gore and all this other stuff. If I'm going to write something, I'm going to portray it right, or it's not worth writing. And there's some heavy sex trafficking scenes in this book as well. And I interviewed victims, oh. 14 victims that were in sex trafficking to get into this. I interviewed uh, FBI agents because there's a lot of agents in there. I had actually one of my focus group members is an FBI agent. It's because I wanted to make sure I was using the terminology right. And, but my favorite that I really love about the keystroke killer is that it's based off of, now I'm tooting my horn here, but it's based off of Stephen Hawking's M theory of multiple dimensions because the controlling serial killer is actually from the fourth dimension controlling these guys. So that comes out. Wow. Now I called Stephen Hawking's, you know, I've had over 20 books already. I had my television show. I'm not shy. I used to call people. Hey, can I interview you? You know? So I called Stephen's office over in um, Cambridge and I said, Hi, I'm Dr. Melissa Cottle, and I'm writing this book on your theory, the M theory, and I really want to get the science right. Would you, you have a convenient time to call me? Not like, like he's going to call me back. But the answer is always no until you ask. About two weeks later, I get a call, and the first thing I hear is, is this Dr. Melissa Cottle? You know, that computer voice? Oh, my I go, God. I go, yes. He goes, I'm Stephen Hawking. I know. And I'm quiet. Wait, I like. And he goes, are you there? <laughs> uh, uh, Melissa, are you there? And I couldn't even speak. I was like, I do not deserve to be on this on the phone with you. But thank, oh, wow. He says, well, I understand that you are writing a sci-fi novel. I said, yes, I am. He says, well, tell me about it and how my theory plays in. So I told him. And about three hours later, I'm going, I feel like a kindergartner because he's explaining to me his theory. Wow. You know, and I'm going, oh my God, you know, and I have a PhD, so I'm not exactly not smart, you know, but I felt like a kindergartner. You know, I'm like, oh, tell me more, tell me more. And over the course of three weeks, he'd call me and he goes, well, send me the chapter and I'll read it. Okay. And then he go, well, you know, you need to consider this. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so that's why that book is dedicated to Stephen Hawking. I am floored. Yes. Huh? I am floored. know that. Oh, yeah. So he was, if it ever got on Netflix, hopefully we'll pick it up one day, but he wanted to be in it. Wow. And I said, of course you can, but he died, unfortunately. Ugh. But so I've interviewed Stephen Hawking for that. I interviewed the serial killers for that. Now let's talk about Adam, Rebecca. Yes, ma'am. Adam, Beginning of Life is actually based off of a true scientific discovery. And in 2010, a wonderful astrobiological physicist by the name of, this is the true part, Dr. Felicia Simon Wolf discovered a microbe in the bottom of Mono Lake and the nuclear and RNA peptides of this particular microbe had all of the elements of human beings, hydrogen, uh, phosphorus, calcium, oxygen, everything that we had with one exception. That microbe did not have phosphorus, but it thrived off of arsenic. Okay. This is a true story, all right? Wow. This is true. You can look up alien life form and Mono Lake. Just Google it, people. Trust me, you'll see what Google I'm talking people. about. <laughs> Google it, people. So I actually dreamt this it was a screenplay first i actually dreamt the screenplay from start to finish as if i saw a freaking movie wow i got up the next morning and i started writing and writing and writing and writing five days later i had a screenplay and then i reached out to dr simon felicia wolf yeah so and uh, because I, I i i reached out to her i reached out to other astrobiological uh, physicist and I said is there a possibility how can life form and so Rebecca you did the uh, I, I don't expect you to read the preface for the audio narration but I have a preface in the book 
that explains the real scientific and the possibilities of what is going on. Wow. Now, I also happened to ask Stephen Hawking this too. Of course, while I had it on the phone. Of course. Well, I got you on the phone. Well, I just, I, by the way, Stephen, you know, I had a screenplay about, you know, this. And he said, well, I know about that life form. He says, and yes, and if it is exposed to oxygen, it does generate life. So yes, that is a very possibility of happening. And I said, oh, amen. I'm in. <laughs> so that one, that's how that one was based off of real. But of course, I took it way beyond and did the what if. What if it did develop into this thing? Yeah. And he just, and you'll get into it. Uh, I won't give you a spoiler alert since you're not there yet, since you're just now you know, starting. But this thing, creature, forms a relationship with Dr. Bradford in a very unique way. And they start, and it's almost, that particular book is, the acronym ADAM stands for Astral Biological Driven Arsenic Microbe. So that's Adam. Yeah. That's why there's those dots there. And, and when he becomes, uh, the, the, the life form becomes talking with Dr. Bradford, he insists on being given a name right. and she goes, Adam. There so that's how that name and how that one came all about. Well, I have to see the prologue. It's in the book. I didn't send it. Oh, no, the, the preface that you mentioned. That you oh, wrote. okay. Yes. I want to see that. Okay, well, it's in the in the book. Just read it. Most people will skip it, but you really need to read it. You really need to read, but don't don't you don't have to narrate it. Okay, okay. I'm no. surprised that's not narrated. I would think that the readers would want to know that. Yep. Okay, Rebecca, when you read it, I'll leave that up to your wisdom as the audio narrator. How's that? That's how easy I'm to work with, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Done. Now, uh, secret romances. You ready for how that one came about, Chris? Yeah. Is that a, a friend of yours? <laughs> <laughs> um, not Maybe. really, but uh, in 2005, this house uh, got hit with a tornado after Hurricane Katrina. We didn't oh. flood, but we couldn't live in it for two years. So my husband, I had my daughter at the time. By the way, her name is Jamie. Uh, she was 16 years old, cheerleader. The whole uh -huh. works. So that character is kind of based off of her. Uh -huh. But we had to live, I say had to, like it was misery, at our condo on the beach. I own a condo in Gulf Shores, Orange Beach, Alabama. And so while we were living there for two years, I had been working with the film industry here, you know, in New Orleans. And now I'm kind of like out of a job. So the first thing I did, I said, well, well I can write. So I went to the, the newspaper and I actually got a job as a journalist. Uh, like one of their people that wrote, you know, interviewed people, did journalism. And there was this uh, two guys and they were starting up their television station. And so I went to interview them. Well, the next thing I know, I'm managing their television station <laughs> and producing everything for them. Oh my gosh. Now, so that character, although it's a magazine, it's really based off of some of those people that uh -huh. were that television station. <laughs> And the lady that uh, taken after Miss Whitford is not me, okay? It, it is not me, but she was the money behind that. Situation. I see. Okay. So that, and while we were there, my daughter was in a theater class and she wanted, she had to write a short story, you know, thing to portray on stage. Uh -huh. And so one of the scenes, uh, we actually made up the whole short film and we did the short film Secret Romances and that's where that book came from. Oh, very good. How about that, folks? Now, now you know everything you need to know about me. Well, and Secret <laughs> Romances seems like a realistic book. It could happen. Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> and it's not really, it's not going to be one of those lusty sexual things. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, KSK, psh, it makes Fifty Shades of Grey and Silence of the Lamb look like PG, ready for a first grader, you know? Oh, my. Uh, that's how dark and deep, and Timothy, you know, because you know the parts that you auditioned for. They're dark, deep, and twisted, yes. But Secret Romances is a fun 
comedy romance, almost yeah. like a Harlequin movie. Yeah. yeah. A Hallmark movie, not Harlequin. Yeah. Hallmark. <laughs> so that was that one. So I am privileged that I have found wonderful voices for those three. And when we get Jesse on, we'll talk about Never Stop Running a little bit more. But that one was is based off of a real person. Um, and her past lives and i transcribed over a hundred hours of wow. ring, you know tapes and, and i'm not saying people have to believe in reincarnation but when you read this book you're gonna go hmm what uh -huh. if because there are some things there that just i was like whoa there is a particular element in that book that she pinpointed to the exact date that wasn't even discovered until 2018 and she knew it in 1987. Wow. See, yeah. I, I was very interested in that Never Stop Running book because I believe in, you know, reincarnation and things like that. And, and yeah, it's some things that there's no, you can't question. No. If, just, yeah. And we did the lineage. Uh, I researched all of these people. Those were real people. It was wow. just like, what? And she had amnesia. And that's the only reason why she went to see the regression hypnotist is to get her memories back. She met her husband and her kids. And when did I get married? And where did I go to high school? She didn't know. She didn't know. Back. Yeah, she didn't know she was going to get all that now. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. And there's a part two to that because everybody, um, uh, even Jesse, Jesse Drum is the one that's narrating uh, Never Stop Running for me. Mm -hmm. And she says, I miss these characters. <laughs> Because uh, I want more. I said, there's a part two. Don't worry. Oh, yes. I said, and you get the part two. See, now that's the brilliant part, girls. Rebecca, Adam yeah. has the part two. Do you think I'm going to audition anybody? <laughs> no. You got that, baby. You know, and you, you know, Chris, you've got secret romances, and there'll be a part two through five probably of that. I'll take it. <laughs> you know? So, and I have another book, Timothy that is done from a male's perspective that won't need a male narrator. So who knows? There you know, go. It has nothing to do with any of that. You know, we're but, that in, Timothy. Oh yeah. No, my goal of my audition and, and I will talk about the audition process now because it was long, lengthy and probably overdue and not overdue, but like, what is that woman thinking? Me, me. y'all were telling me, you know, like she must be nuts and off her rocker, you know, but that I had number one, I didn't even know how to start finding audio narrators. So I found ACX. That's where I found y'all. But I think coming from the movie industry and the television industry, I auditioned a lot of actors for films and things like that. Mm -hmm. And to me, I was trying to find the voice because once I had it for that book, I knew I'd be set. Now that's a long-term investment, right? You know, on something, and then the teacher part of me, because I was a teacher for 14 years, principal, central office administrator, and I developed a rubric uh, assessment tool to be able to subjectively say who's doing what. And so y'all didn't know it. At, I finally released it for Adam, but y'all didn't know that I had certain lines. And the way you said it, you got value points for the way you said it or the way you transitioned from one character to another, the way you did this or way you, you know, and all of a sudden the points line up and there was three of us doing this. It wasn't just me. I have a casting team because I have a manager and I have an agent. And, you know, so I have a, I have a casting team for to find these voices. And when you got for Keystroke Keller, I had over like 267 of you, Tim. Wow. And those auditions were 20 minutes long. So that's why it took me four months. Yeah. And this is why it took me so long for Adam. Matter of fact, Rebecca was so shocked. She thought I'd already cast Adam. <laughs> I had thrown in the towel. Yeah, she, she threw in the towel. I go, what are you talking about? I haven't cast Adam. I took it down because I found my narrator. She goes, oh, who, you? You know? <laughs> like, what? You know? I said, it takes me a while because with all my travels and things, but when the three of us are doing it, we listen to them individually with our rubrics and then we put it, pull in my top 10 and who's ever in my top 10 and her top 10 and his top 10, we know they're the top 10 and they didn't always match. So sometimes we had like 15 
then we had to, you know, but then we narrowed it to our top 10 and we mm -hmm. threw out all of the Rubik's that we had done and started over. Wow. <laughs> and you were assessed on the way you said things or the way you did things. And, and sometimes it was so minute between the way somebody, um, I'll talk about Jesse right now for a minute. It, it was so close, Rebecca, for you on um, Never Stop Running. But it was the way, and it was, I had to be her voice because she was a teacher and Jackie was a teacher. And it was just, she just sounded like Jackie. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Well, you knew what you were looking for. <laughs> yeah, but when it came down to it, when she did the 911 scene call, and I got chills and I look over and Tina had chills and then I looked at David and he's going, <laughs> we will. And when we looked at all the scores, it was that one, well, about four sentences in that, that shot her up. And so is, that's how crazy it was. Yeah. Well, and that's why I was going to send you, like a redo. I'm like, wait, I don't think she's picked it yet. Let me, let me redo it another way. And, and I'll send that in and see. And then I didn't end up doing it. And I'm like, well, we'll see what happens. And then, I, <laughs> then you get the call for cigarette romances. Right. There you go. You're in Tim's boat. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. Oh, but I got this. Wait. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I, I don't forget about you.